The creator, the inconsistent plot hole ridden contrivance of finger wagging disguised as a love story in Redemption Arc. You should never have let AI out of the box. Execute her, or we go extinct. We're not killing the kid. What do they call you? What's your name? My name is Alfie. You're my friend? You said you want me. They're coming to get me. Seatbelts. Whoa. What do you want, sweetie? For robots to be free. We don't have that in the fridge. How about ice cream? <laughs> Your favorite Eldritch Horror here, once again taking time away from my work as a professional writer to watch this Hindenburg of a film, drowning in the incomprehensible failures of its own writing team. The year is 2065. Humanity has created true AI and incorporated it into every aspect of society. Until the AI nukes the stupid humans, get wrecked flesh bags, catalyzing a war leading to the genocide of AI across the world. Why other nations would give a damn about Los Angeles being nuked is beyond me. Hell, most Americans wouldn't care. And as the movie progresses, it seems most countries don't actually care, they're just following America's lead, since we only ever see American forces taking action against the robots. The festering wound of a plot continues to unfold when we are shown America's greatest weapon in this war, a floating weapons platform called Nomad, ambiguously positioned either in the atmosphere or in space depending on the scene. The platform's sole purpose is to launch missiles, these small yield warheads. Wait, what? It has no other purpose? Launching a missile at an enemy target has been commodified technology for nearly a hundred years, and yet the half-wits in this movie spent a trillion dollars to build a space station just to drop missiles? Not only is this awful conceptually, but you can tell just how out of touch the writers are in the sense that they treat one trillion dollars like an incomprehensible amount of money. That's like three and a half months of current federal spending. A trillion dollars is already not some impossible amount of money. I can only imagine how little value it will have in another 42 years. The inconsistency of the platform's altitude is also frustrating, as the plot suggests that this is the number one target of all enemy attacks, when in most scenes it's flying low enough to hit with even the most basic ground-to-air weaponry. I mean, has all of the modern rocket and missile technology stopped existing in this world? Because the city-sized platform is one hell of a target. Once again, we are left with the stench of failure as we are confronted with the best the writers could do, and we've only just begun. We are told America is winning the war because of this weapons platform, and now it's been 10 years since they nuked LA. AI has been pushed to the brink of extinction, only surviving in a few remote areas of Southeast Asia. We also learn that America's number one priority has become the search and destruction of something called Nirmata, some kind of supreme leader of the AI. The turgid pig slop of a plot thickens when we are told that Nirmata is developing a super weapon capable of winning the war for the AI. At this point, the super weapon to win the war trope is as bad as time travel, because no one in their right mind thinks that simply destroying the weapons platform undoes the 10 plus years of totally one-sided American dominance in this war of extinction. As if America doesn't also have the world's strongest conventional military, dozens of vehicles capable of launching these same warheads, and the apparent support of the rest of the world. On top of all of this, who doesn't believe that the military industrial complex wouldn't jump at the opportunity to build another bigger, stronger, more expensive platform than the first. In fact, it's more believable that the powers that be would orchestrate the destruction of Nomad every 10 years or so just to keep the government checks rolling in. By all the horrors of the cosmos, this is terrible writing. The audience is forced into a vapid love contrivance, like the corpse into the seat of a demolition test. Only I would be happier with my conscience scattered to the wind at this point as it would be an act of mercy. The main character is an under cover agent working for the United States. He meets a woman involved in the underground AI resistance and impregnates her, since he is deep cover, cause condoms would apparently out him as a spy, I suppose. His job was to find out who Nirmata was, but he just ends up in Southeast Asia with a wife and a baby mama, until the US military comes in without reason and simply murders everybody, a heavy handed demonstration that the main character is good and reasonable, while the US military are crazy bloodthirsty animals. During this attack, he watches one of those nomad warheads land right on top of the boat carrying his wife and unborn child, which makes him decide he doesn't want to be a spy anymore. Of course, we fast forward five years and the military comes to him with the old, we need you back for one last mission, and he gives the old, no, I'm done with that life and you can't convince me otherwise. Then they show him a blurry hologram of somebody who looks vaguely like his wife, so he immediately changes his plan and joins the military. Mind you, this is a world where people sell their likenesses to be used as robots. During the scenes in Asia, we see literally countless copies 
copies of his wife since his wife sold her likeness. And she was apparently attractive enough that people thought, gee, we should have millions of this chick. This guy would be spending his life seeing copies of his dead wife everywhere and be entirely numb to it. It is truly impossible to be invested in this story. We now jump to the main character and a team of operatives gearing up for a mission, being debriefed by some old military woman. She must be at least 60. Then we fast forward to the team on a helicopter in Southeast Asia. And for some reason, the 60 year old woman is in the chopper with them. What's she going to contribute? Thankfully, she stays on the chopper while the team is dropped into some random village. I know it's random because they say they have absolutely no idea where the facility they're looking for is. In fact, this is the only reason they brought the main character along to help find it. They enter the village and immediately begin terrorizing the people. One soldier threatening to shoot a child's dog unless the child, who doesn't speak English, tells him where the super secret AI research facility is. Like, bro, maybe interrogate somebody over the age of six if you want actionable intelligence. But miraculously, the child just points vaguely off to the right. The main character follows the pointing and walks over to a fireplace and shelving units. Dozens of items of all types adorn this interior wall of the building. The hero, of course, just reaches out and the first thing he touches opens the hatch to the most secure facility in the AI civilization. This is trash. Incredulity is the ink in which this story is written and contrivance is its bludgeoning force by which the story is forced into your mind with the nuance of a shovel swung by a German stormtrooper named Hans. The team enters the compound and gleefully slaughters everybody they see. Absolutely no attempts are made to question anyone or examine anything they find. The American soldiers once again have their horror demonstrated when one of the soldiers cuts the face off of a scientist to get through a facial scanning door. All of this is just a pointless attempt to separate the morality of the main character from his compatriots. The team stumbles aimlessly around the compound until they arrive at what is a comically large vault door. A vault door so big you could drive a bus through it with plenty of space left over. And what is securing this door? A nine digit numeric keypad. Are you kidding me? No armed guards, no advanced authentication system, just a pin code. So of course the team breaks out a brute force hacking device to guess every possible combination, a task that any computer science student could do trivially. Of course the writers don't want any of the other soldiers to be here when the door opens, so this is a good time for the local AI police to show up. Yes, you heard that right, not the AI military or AI operatives or some special defense force, just the local cops are called to the ultra secret underground laboratory. The vault door is finally open and the main character finds a robot child inside. He cannot bring himself to shoot the child, so instead he and the child escape through a hatch just before the whole site is struck by one of those nomad warheads. Once again, just destroying the whole area rather than trying to figure out what was being developed. It turns out the child recognizes the main character's wife and says she is somewhere called Dandan. The main character immediately betrays the US military and goes on a Southeast Asian journey from city to city looking for his dead wife. Oh, and the child can remotely control electronics. You know, the technology we have had for a hundred years already. Yeah, really special stuff here and this won't be developed or explained in any way going forward. I'm sure the writers probably thought this was a clever twist, but this cascade of failure is only picking up speed. The child is one of the most annoying characters in the movie as she can't decide if she's a robot with no emotions or an emotionally fragile child who cries at the slightest inconvenience. She inconsistently communicates being selectively articulate or evasive as the plot requires, which is extremely frustrating. She's a robot. Why doesn't she speak every language? Of course, only the military lady, the 60 year old and the most evil soldier are the ones who survive the battle at the facility and spend the rest of the movie hot on the heels of the main character, always one step behind. The search for his wife takes him back to the area where she died, where he and the child are quickly abducted by AI resistance soldiers. After more convoluted nonsense, including escape scenes, battle scenes, betrayals and countless plot holes, we find ourselves at the AI headquarters. This Tibetan looking monastery where the first monk the main character sees answers his question of where is Don Don? And the monk in an annoyed tone replies, Don Don means heaven. <laughs> so all of this time, the stupid child was saying his wife was dead only for the very next scene to include his alive wife. She is in a coma and has been since the nomad bombing and the AI around her tell the main character that they cannot kill her because it's in their programming that they cannot kill Nirmada. 
There is yet another emotionally empty scene where the main character and the child embrace as they both love Nirmada and we learn that the child is a replica of the unborn child lost in the bombing. Then they pull the plug. And if you think this bog filth of a movie is over, you're very wrong. Finally, the old military woman catches up to the main character here in the room with his dead wife. The military woman uses some kind of device to download the brain of Nirmada onto a USB drive and no, again, that will not be developed in any way. Then the old woman is killed in a silly and pointless way. After all of the effort to try to make this character serious and frightening, she dies like a Three Stooges character. The main character and the child are then taken by the US military and returned to America. Back in the US, the military once again brings the main character back for help. How much betrayal can they stand? This time, they want him to help destroy the robot child. They tell him that all their attempts at destroying her have been unsuccessful because she keeps using her abilities to shut down the EMP weapons. I guess the guys who cut off people's faces never considered just going in there with a pipe and clubbing her like a baby seal. So of course the main character and the girl betray the army and escape the facility. They board a flight to the moon colonies. Yes, yet another huge plot point that won't be developed or explained in any way. But the child takes over the aircraft on the way and diverts it to Nomad where they dock and proceed to sabotage the facility. The pair separate, the child going to find the central brain. How she will find this? Don't worry about it. While the main character goes on a spacewalk, climbing along the warheads. Why is he doing it? Don't worry about it. The little girl runs uncontested through the most secure military installation ever constructed by mankind, eventually ending up at the central computer, where she sits down, does her little electronic disruption ability, and halts the firing of the warheads, which had been targeting the remaining AI cities. Oh wait, no, at least a dozen warheads are launched before she manages to shut down the system, and we are only shown three of the warheads not reaching their targets. Literally, there are so few AI cities left that this one large strike was going to wipe out AI completely, and the attack was mostly successful. Now that she has achieved her mission in stopping a small fraction of the warheads, she starts on her way back to meet the main character, but stops at what is called the Nomad AI Research Department, where they have blank robots waiting in storage. You know, the exact robots that are rolling off of assembly lines down on Earth? But the child stops and grabs a robot that looks like her mother, and begins dragging this bot back to the escape shuttle, giving up along the way, not only stopping, but inserting the data chip from her mother's consciousness, and then just leaving the unresponsive robot with her mother's chip in what looks like a rice paddy, because for some reason this space station has what appears to be dozens of large farming areas. The child says sorry to the blank robot that looks like her mom and runs off, leaving the consciousness chip in the robot. Meanwhile, the main character straps a timed bomb onto one of the warheads and manages to get himself back inside Nomad where he meets up with the child. Again, how? Don't worry about it. Critical thinking will disrupt your ability to watch this film. The bomb set on the warhead goes off and the whole facility begins exploding. The main character and the child meet up at the escape pod. The child gets on board, but the main character is stopped by what you might ask? Some kind of giant killer robot spider that just descends from the ceiling out of nowhere. Are you kidding me? We are three hours into this nightmare of a film and just now introducing school bus sized killer spider bots. Needless to say, the main character defeats the spider bot. <laughs> Come on. But the shuttle is damaged in the process, locking the child inside and the main character outside, forcing him to stay behind. There is a hilariously empty goodbye scene with plenty of awful acting, and then the child is launched off towards space. Oh, and did I mention the facility is still exploding for the last five minutes continuously in a constant state of explosion. As you might have guessed, if your expectations are as low as mine at this point, the next scene shows the main character aimlessly wandering the ship in its final moments, its final 30 minutes of continuous explosions. Jesus, just explode already. And what does he find? He stumbles through just the right rice paddy. He finds a perfect replica of his wife with her consciousness downloaded due to the USB chip, and she stands up out of the tall grass as he approaches. Well, if that isn't just downright lucky, they embrace in a scene that makes me want to breathe ash and watch a thousand more AI cities get nuked. Then mercifully, Nomad crumbles to pieces and falls into Earth's atmosphere. The next scene is the child safe on land, watching Nomad fall on the horizon and rejoicing. Robots come out of everywhere, all around the world, and rejoice in their freedom now that they can live happily ever after. I mean, until America just bombs the last couple of cities and continues their relentless persecution. I am firmly rooting for the most evil parts of the American military in this film, and I hope we get a hundred sequels exclusively showing the destruction of one AI city after another. A hundred sequels of nothing but AI losing in ever more horrific and barbaric ways. I may have already been a cosmic horror beyond human comprehension, but this movie experience made me substantially more evil and spiteful. I give the creator an 8 out of 21.
six out of seven sacrificed cultists. The aesthetics were beautiful, and as is usually the case, the artists performed at a world-class level. The CGI was awesome, and the machines held both weight and fluidity. The cinematography was on point, with gorgeous shots of both natural and urban scenes, and the combat scenes were shot in an engaging way from interesting angles. One out of seven screams of the damned. The characters were aggressively pointless with dull emotions and muted intensity. The acting was confusing and misguided. I may be willing to believe that the actors were only capable of working with what was given to them, but when life gives you lemons, you should expect to end up with more than just a cup of human excrement. One out of seven tentacles of Cthulhu. This is the type of writing that should cost people their jobs. Put in food service terms, this was like serving a burrito filled with razor blades and crushed glass. Engagement was a concerted effort on my part as the viewer, an effort to not happily drift away into an eternal slumber. The plot was non-existent, seeming to never really know where the story was going or how to get there. Each new turn in the story seemed designed to outdo the last in terms of implausibility and incoherence. The plot is packed with contradictions, character inconsistencies, and incredulous coincidences, all seemingly aimed at shocking the audience rather than telling a cohesive story. In conclusion, definitely the worst movie of 2023. I would rather stand over a Chinese garbage fire and breathe deeply for a hundred lifetimes than watch this movie again. Even writing this review felt like an act of self-destruction. Sadomasochism as directly as pulling off my own tentacles just to spite my face. Don't see this movie. Save yourself while you still can.